All right. Well, good morning. morning. It's good to see uh, everybody here today. Uh, And, you know, I really mean that. I I don't know if you guys ever question my sincerity, but (laughs) um, it's really good to see everybody. And uh, it just seems like we have exploded uh, in numbers. We've been adding so many new members. And to be able to even have your kids in my high school class has been awesome, but it's just good. And it's a beautiful day, and it's a wonderful time for us to worship God together. Let's go ahead and start with a prayer. Bow your heads with me if you would, and uh, we'll go ahead and begin with a a word of of prayer. Our Holy Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of our great King and Lord Jesus Christ. We know that in your goodwill and in your heart for us and out of your love, you sent him that he might walk upon this earth, being born of a virgin, healing those in society that have been outcast, humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And you, Father, in your justice, raised him to a glorious new life, rectifying all wrongs that were done unjustly against him. And so, Father, we look to him for justice. And we look to you for justice. Father, as we continue our series today, I just want to pray a very special prayer that at this time you help us uh, to somewhat take the worldly cares and the thoughts that we have and the busyness and just give us peace and rest in this moment to hear you speak. Father, we have our hearts open, our ears open, our Bibles open to receive your word. So, Father, convict us by your Holy Spirit that we might be trained in all the way of Jesus Christ to go forward and to do what is just. Father, thank you for this moment, and I do pray this blessing upon everyone, upon us as a church. We ask in Jesus' holy name, and amen. All right, so uh, the way that I want to begin today is I just want to kind of ask a very basic question, and that is, what is a righteous person? What's a righteous person? Do you know a righteous person? What comes to mind? What does righteousness look like? If, uh, if you were to have to describe to somebody what a righteous person is, or if you can think of a righteous person that you know, how would you describe their manner of living? Now, I know this is a word that we don't really use all that frequently outside of a church setting. Um, you don't really hear it out in the world all that much, but we have to reckon with it, right? Because we're talking about justice. We've been in this justice series for a while now, and we're just beginning to crest towards towards the end, right? So what what is a righteous person? How would you describe them? Now, if you are one of the individuals who has your outline, your bulletin outline, there's even a little place where you can write out and figure out what are the marks of this righteousness. But as you're thinking about that, what I want us to do is I want us to go ahead and grab our Bible, whether digital or analog, and we're going to turn to Job chapter 29 as we seek to answer this question together, as we seek to just ask the question and see what does God say When he presents before us someone who lives righteously, someone who walks in justice, all right? So I'm a Bible open to Job chapter 29, and we're going to read just a section of scripture here together. Job chapter 29. What is a righteous person? Well, let's hear what God says through Job. Beginning of verse 11, if you would. Job 29. When the ear heard, it called me blessed. And when the eye saw, it approved. Because I delivered the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to help him. The blessing of him who was about to perish came upon me. And I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on, listen to him, verse 14, I put on righteousness. And it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. And I was a father to the needy. And I searched out the cause of him whom I did not know. I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made him drop his prey from his teeth. Now this is God's word. 
Now, I don't know what you wrote on your outline. I don't know what was the mental conception of the person you had in your mind when you thought of a righteous person, but did any of these factors that Job uses to describe himself, did that factor into how we describe the righteous person? A person who speaks up for the poor and the needy, a person who considered the fatherless, the one he did not know, stood up for them, rebuked the oppressor, and eliminated that. You know, sometimes in in the Western individualistic society in our culture, especially modern evangelical culture, Christian culture, we kind of think of a righteous person as someone who just individually lives a spotless, blemishless life, who is a morally upstanding citizen. But does it factor into how we consider the righteous person, the just person, the one who stands up for the vulnerable? Now, this is important for us to consider today because we have been talking about justice in our series. And we had made a comment some weeks ago about how intricately woven the word righteousness, which we love, and justice, which we have some qualms about perhaps, and how they're related in the Bible to the person that God made, the person that God calls us to be. Now, do you guys remember how we've been talking about in my lessons where I'm trying to bridge the context for some of the theology that Mike has been presenting to us and just bridging the context to consider What does that mean for us today? How exactly are we supposed to live? Do you remember the phrase quartet of the vulnerable? Does everybody remember that? Do we remember that? Okay, who was a part of the quartet of the vulnerable? This this grouping of people that God mentions over and over and over again that he's concerned with. We think about the poor, right? And so we had a lesson talking about the poor and how we can be more helpful than hurtful when it comes to the poor. We talked about immigration and refugees and the immigrant because God mentions them as well. But who's the rest that he talks about? In the quartet, in the four, the poor, the immigrant, the fatherless, the widow. The poor, the immigrant, the fatherless, the widow. The poor, the immigrant, some translations say the orphan and the widow. And what we want to talk about today is that last grouping, okay? I got three simple points this morning, and the first one is talking about the last of the quartet. So you might be asking the question, at least I hope you are, uh, why is it that in the quartet, we have four, are we addressing the fatherless and the widow together, right? Because we're not talking about them individually. We're not seeing them as separate entities, but we're going to be looking at them as a couplet. Now, it's not immediately obvious why we're doing that, but it will be as we continue to walk through these passages. First thing we have to reckon with, what does the Bible say about it? Number one, it is made abundantly clear throughout the Word of God that these are individuals who are vulnerable in society that God is concerned about. He cares about the orphan and the widow. He cares about the fatherless and widow. I have many passages, uh, as you're looking at your outline, whether the digital or manual there, um, where God talks about this group. And we're not going to read all of them. We don't have time to do that. But we are going to look at a few of them. You look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 18. You look at Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 24 and 25. God speaks about this group. And what's significant is that this care that we should have for the fathers and widow, the last of the courts of the vulnerable, is rooted in God's own nature. Look at Psalm 68, for example, one of the passages listed there, where it says, Sing to God, sing praises to his name, Lift up a song to him who rides through the desert. His name is Yahweh. His name is the Lord. Exult before him. Father of the fatherless, protector of widows, is God in his holy habitation. In other words, this isn't just some arbitrary group God tells us to care for, but this is rooted in God's own nature himself. That's how he delights to describe himself as a just God, that I'm the one who is a father, to the orphan or the fatherless. I'm the one who protects and cares for the widows here. We're going to look at uh, just one example out of the many passages that we have there in your outline, okay? So out of all the ones, I just want us, if we can for a moment, to home in on Exodus 22. Here's what it says. This is in the Law of Moses, and notice what he writes, and I've thrown it on the board for your convenience, but you can turn there in your Bible if you want a little more context. That's okay, too. So he says, You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath will burn, says the Lord, and I will kill you with the sword. And your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Now, out of all the examples that I could choose, why did I choose this one? (laughs) 
Here's why. One of the reasons why I want to highlight this example in particular is that it demonstrates that we actually shouldn't see fatherless and widow as two separate incongruous realities. Like that we talked about that, right? We talked about them as the quartet of the vulnerable. That implies four. And that's somewhat of a misnomer because what is actually being demonstrated in this text is that they're not separate things, but rather a unit. When you read, that might be surprising for some of us, but when you read the fatherless and the widow in the Bible, we are talking about a single family unit, a couplet, a quartet is a misnomer because these two specifically are always mentioned together in the Bible because they're a natural family unit that occurs or is created when the death or the absence of a father happens, all right? The fatherless refers to an individual who has lost their father. They still have a mother. She's a widow now, but they're together. Now, why am I belaboring this point? Why is that significant? I think it's important to highlight this nuance because a lot of times we were asked the question, listen, we're Christians. We want to walk in the manner of Christ. We want to help people. That's what uh, my lessons have been pr- predominantly about is, is how do, where does the rubber meet the road? How does this apply today? We want to help in that situation. But how do, we, how do we help the orphan and the widow? I think, naturally, the first thing we think about is, okay, well, that means if we're going to help the orphan and the widow, well, that means go visit some widows and adopt some babies, right? Like, that's, that's what we think. Visit widows, adopt babies. That's what we want to do. And no wonder, no wonder. Because what we have to do is, in bridging context, we have to reckon not just with their world in the ancient Near Eastern society, but how do we think about it today? And sometimes what we do is we take things today, fixtures, institutions, and we read it into the text when it's not necessarily there. We highlight this nuance that this is a single family unit because we naturally think about adoption through the Christian adoption movement. Why wouldn't we? Which is a fairly recent phenomenon, uh, you know, in history. Um, and many of us, we, we have ties to adoption in some way. I know that, uh, especially for our group, the Conservative Churches of Christ, we think about Sacred Selections, a fundraiser that's all meant to employ uh, the Christian adoption movement. That's, that's what we think of. We can't help. This is the lens through which we read everything. And I'm, that itself is, is itself a question. Why do we read it with that lens? Why is that? And should we re-examine the biblical view of adoption? I think we should, and so that's what we're going to do today. The second point I want to make today is we're just going to go through a survey, all right? So I'm going to be your tour guide today, as I I like to be on Sundays. I think of myself more as a tour guide than anything else. And we're just going to tour a theory, or rather a theology of adoption, okay? And we're going to talk about some of these points. The first stop uh, as we develop this theology of adoption, as we re-examine what the Bible has to say, is first of all, let's consider the fatherless and the widow where we already began. Now, we already made this case somewhat, but it was particularly important to remember this as a unit because when you look at their world, this isn't always the case today, when you look in their world, it's a patriarchal society. The breadwinner was the man, and it was usually only the man. And whenever they would sustain a loss, whether a husband or a father would die through various life circumstances, this could be absolutely financially devastating to this, to this couplet, to this family. Now, um, it's, it's not exactly that way in the Western world, even though, you know, that's even sort of a fairly recent thing. Uh, I don't know about you, but my mother, I can even think about my own mother. She's, now, she eventually did go to college, and she's a medical dosimetrist at Community North, but that wasn't the way she was raised. You know, she was never encouraged to go to college, right? It was always like, you know, you marry a good man and who's going to provide for you? And unfortunately, whenever that happens, sometimes if you lose the man, you are just devastated financially. You leave yourself to socioeconomic vulnerabilities. And that was more so the case in their world. I want to read you a quote because we're trying to jump in to the world of the Bible, right? I want to read you a quote from David Smolin. He says this, Judaism, um, when you look at their society, it's, and what he's trying to say here is that it's, it's difficult to read our modern adoption movement into the Bible because the society of the Jews really undermined the need for that to begin with. Here's what he says, quote, Judaism had in contrast to the ancient 
pagan Greco-Roman world, a pro-life ethic that generally protected the lives of Jewish infants. Uh, he's saying, unlike the society, the Jews had a pro-life ethic that protected the lives of the infants. Jews regarded children as a blessing. They took seriously the Genesis commandment to be fruitful and multiply. And with some notorious exceptions, generally did not participate in the pagan practices of infanticide or the exposure of their infants, as was common in the Roman world. Jews were also religiously and culturally focused on the intergenerational continuation of their family groups as a primary goal. All that means is that the Jews had created a society in tandem with God's word that was so family focused, it was so offspring promise focused, it was so family lines and biological ties focused that they undermined entirely what we see as a need for adoption and the, the hundreds of orphans, the hundreds of thousands of orphans that we cite often today. So we don't really see anything that we see as adoption in our world. We don't really see that in the Bible. Now, you might ask a question, all right? Well, what about Moses? Well, what about Moses? That's a good example. Moses was adopted, right? Well, think about Moses. Moses was placed in this precarious situation where because Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had called for the genocide, the infanticide of all of these Hebrew infants through the Hebrew midwives, he was placed into a small little ark and put down the Nile River, where eventually he was saved through uh, a woman of Pharaoh's household, the daughter of Pharaoh. And what happens immediately after that? As Miriam, his sister, is following him, she's discovered, rather Moses is discovered by the, the, the daughter of Pharaoh there, and she looks for a Hebrew who can nurse him. And so Moses was taken immediately back to his mother by Miriam, right, where he was nursed. Now, we don't relate to this as well because if we nurse at all, we typically wean them about a year. He wouldn't have been weaned probably for anywhere from four to six years old. And so there he's taken up into the family, brought up into Egypt, trained in the Pharaoh's household, and what happens? He goes back to his people, right? And we see there written in Hebrews chapter 11, for example, the language, well, he chose rather to be mistreated with God's people um, than to remain with the passing pleasures of sin. So Moses doesn't really count. Okay, well, let's think about other examples. Do we have other adoptions in the Bible? What about Esther? Now, Esther is one of the few individuals in the Bible that it's probably stated of them that they were adopted, okay? I think even some translations differ, but the King James Version says Esther was adopted. Um, and it's one of the only few characters in the Bible where it states that she had neither father nor mother. But what exactly happens with Esther? Esther chapter 2, and in verse 7 states, she's without father or mother, but she was adopted by who? By Mordecai, her kinsman, her cousin. She was still considered Ab uh, the daughter of Abihel. She still considered you know, family and biological ties were still kept, and ultimately to save her own people there. Okay, so what about Paul then? Now, we're going to take a little bit more time to talk about Paul because that's really where the rubber meets the road whenever we think about adoption today. If adoption is mentioned in your Bible, it's probably by Paul. Now, interesting fact. Do you know that out of every gospel presentation in the Bible, every author found a way to describe gospel faith, the faith, without ever using the word adoption. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, James, and Jude, never mentioning adoption. There's only one person who mentions adoption, and that's the Apostle Paul. And even then, he only mentions it five times. There's a few instances he mentions it in Romans, once in Ephesians, and the other time in Galatians. And that's interesting. That's interesting whenever you think about what exactly was he talking about. Now, I am thankful, so thankful, that even though it's exceptional with Paul, that he mentioned adoption, because this is an extraordinary teaching of Paul. Like, I, I mean, it, it boggles the mind to think about what he meant when he described our salvation as a form of adoption. Except, here's the problem, it doesn't often mean what we think it means. What did Paul mean whenever he brings up the word adoption? First of all, the word in your Bible translated adoption, if your translations say that, and you can look at a few passages I wrote on your outline. One would be Romans 8, 15, uh, 8, verse 23, 9, chapter 9, verse 4, Galatians 4, 5. The word there is probably better translated as sonship. It's the placing of a son. 
And the reason why Paul uses this word is because it's very unique to the Roman culture. There wasn't anything in the Jewish circles that really corresponded to what he's using uh, the word adoption for. He's using a word from the Roman background. And it makes sense because he's by and large ministering to Gentiles. So what is he saying whenever he writes to them, ours is the adoption, ours is the sonship in Christ Jesus? Their mind went back to a very peculiar Roman practice. In very well-to-do, um, socioeconomically rich uh, families, if they had an inheritance and they weren't able to pass it on to someone who was competent, what they would do in the Roman practice is that they would adopt an individual into their family to take on the name who was competent and who could exercise the rights, the gifts to carry on the family name. And there was actually no group that was more famous for this than the Roman emperors, right? Than the Caesar, okay? Now we know Julius Caesar, the first de facto of the Roman, uh, the first de facto emperor of the Roman Empire. A great example of this is have you guys seen a Gladiator? You guys seen Gladiator? Okay, every, every head should be like this if, if you've not seen Gladiator. Okay, everybody's got to see that movie. But there's a great example of what I'm talking about. So in the beginning of the movie, Marcus Aurelius, who's a real emperor, is about to die. And he does not believe that his son Commodus is competent to carry on the kingdom. So what does he do? He wants to adopt Maximus to lead the group. Now that was historical fiction, but it, it, it corresponds to a reality that these emperors, with all of their power, wanted to bring in an individual outside to carry on the name. Now, what is Paul saying then about your Christianity, your faith? You're an outsider. You're a Gentile. You have no place with God. And then Jesus Christ, the only genuine son, Jesus Christ, the only child who lived, breathed, died doing the will of God, who has all of the inheritance, now yours is the sonship. And the emphasis should be on sonship. Sometimes translations gets into this thing where they want to be uh, gender equivalent. So they'll say, well, you know, we're both sons and daughters of God. It was significant that whether you were a boy or a girl, whether you were a son or a daughter, yours was the sonship because it implied you are now a joint heir with God. And everything coming to Jesus Christ, it's coming to you. And yours is that immense responsibility. And you were brought into this great tradition and to this family. That was an amazing, amazing doctrine. But it does not correspond to anything that we understand of as adoption today. Lastly, well, what about James 1 and verse 27? That's the one we often go to, right, in the Bible. Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. We know this passage pretty well. Well, this actually brings us full circle. Because what would James have thought of? He was a student of the law and prophets. He was a Jew. He was writing to Jews. When he thought about the fatherless and the widow, he would have thought about the family unit. He would have thought about the couplet. He wouldn't have had anything in mind other than that. He would have thought about Exodus 22 and verse 24 and that implication. He would have thought about the book of Ruth and the kinsman redeemer and the bringing of the family and the biological ties. He would have thought about Elijah. We've been studying about that in Bible class, right? Elijah, who goes to the widow of Zarephath, and what happens with her in 1 Kings 17? She's economically deprived. She's socially vulnerable. Her husband dies, and she's left with this child, and she says, look, we might as well just, we're going to eat the dust. We're, we're going to die. And so he starts this miracle where she's able to fill all these jars with oil and saves her. That's what he's talking about in the Bible. Now, Go ahead and take a, take a breath at this point. <laughs> why did we tour adoption through the Bible? Why, why, do I, why do I say all this? Was it to communicate in some way that adoption is unbiblical and it's wrong, what we know of it today? No, absolutely not. And if uh, that was the implication that you guys got, I want to apologize now. That's certainly not what I was trying to communicate at all. Um, I know many of us in this room have been touched by adoption in some way or another, or perhaps all of us can say we know somebody who is adopted or someone who has uh, worked with sacred selections. I'm, I know many of us can say that. 
And when we look at adoption, there's so much gain that outweighs any sense of loss, certainly. Now, I said this because it's important for us to know that though adoption is a way to help, it is not the only way to help. I want us just to focus our gaze elsewhere if we can. That in fact, there are ways that might actually get closer to what God actually is asking of us if our goal is genuinely to help the fatherless and the widow. If that really is our goal. That maybe our first knee-jerk response should not be, uh, well, you know, visit widows and adopt babies, but rather, if we obey God's call to do justice to this couplet, to this vulnerable family unit, Maybe there's something else we can do. And so that brings me to the last point. And that is, what then can we do? As we bridge context and we think about what was in their world and what's closest to that today, here's what I would say. And you can write this down in your outline if you want. Take the opportunity when it presents itself to help single mothers to keep and to raise their own children, to protect them where you can from financial vulnerabilities. Let me say that again. Take the opportunity when it presents itself to help single mothers to keep and to raise their own children, protecting them where you can from financial vulnerabilities. How many of you guys know that... uh, My wife, Amber, is a birth mother. You guys have probably seen some of her writings on Facebook. She placed her first child for adoption, Riley, in 2006 when she was still in high school. And that was absolutely the right choice for her. If you were to ask her, she would say that was the right choice for me at the time. And it wasn't always that way. At first, whenever she got pregnant, she thought I was going to keep this child. I was going to keep this baby. And her parents were immensely supportive. They brought her onto their own health insurance, they drove her to various doctor's appointments. They even at one point said, you know, if you need help, we'll adopt Riley ourselves, bring them into our own home so that we're responsible for the child. And later on, when she changed her mind and decided, no, she would actually go through with adoption, they were supportive in that way as well. And they took her to various litigious meetings, met with lawyers to ensure all of this went very smoothly. They honestly did everything right. And the reason why I tell you that story is because That's not always the case. We know a sister, and she's a close friend of ours. We'll call her Leslie. She's actually visited us uh, with us here a couple of times. And she's a wonderful, hardworking, a good mom. And she has many children of her own today. Um, But she was, we actually met her, Amber met her, because she's also a birth mother and placed her first child for adoption. And she has a close, open relationship with this adoptive family elsewhere. And um, if you were to ask her, why did you place your first child for adoption? Well, she said, my parents basically gave us an ultimatum. Either you place this baby for adoption or you find somewhere else to live. That was the ultimatum she was given. So she was in high school. So, of course, she, she chose adoption. She had nowhere else to go. And later on, the adoptive mother told her, because they have an open relationship and they talk and and communicate and everything, she told her, listen, whenever my friends ask me why you placed your child for adoption, I never know what to tell them, because, Leslie, you're capable, you're a smart, hardworking woman, why is it that you placed this child for adoption? And she would tell you, because that was the only option I was given. That was the only choice that I could make. Amber and I have a tradition where we go to something called Birth Mother's Day. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Birth Mother's. It always occurs the Saturday before Mother's Day. And ever since I've been engaged to her, we go to this. And usually it'll be held in a church somewhere, and uh, it's a gathering for all these birth mothers. And they'll come in together, and it's just a nice little brunch. We get together to eat, and they'll take a picture of their child that they place for adoption. And Usually there's this point in the ceremony where they'll bring the child, or excuse me, they'll bring the picture of the child up to the front, and they'll light a candle, and they'll just tell a story about them. And it's just, just heartbreaking, if you can imagine, just heartbreaking stories. Real stories, all different, all different shapes and sizes of how they got to that point. And Amber, uh, she has volunteered 
for quite a number of years now for something called Parent Life, which is a non-for-profit. And there's all sorts of stories that play into this. And I want to share some of them with you to, to show you what we're talking about here, the vulnerabilities that people find themselves in. In Parent Life, it was a situation where Amber's helping there with other older women who are sort of mentors to these girls who are in high school who get pregnant. And every girl there had a different background. One was living with ad addicted parents. Um, there was abuse. There were fathers who were either there or not. Uh, parents who were supportive or not. A few were either adopted themselves or actually removed from their parents themselves. So Parent Life was really, this, this non-for-profit organization was really the only time that some of these women ever saw stable adults who could mentor them and help them with so much life advice that we might take for granted because we were raised in a somewhat stable family, right? They were the only time that they could connect on an emotional, spiritual level by walking them through basic things like how to get a driver's license or how to work through career and education options, how to fill out your FAFSA, employment. They would babysit. They'd watch them interact with their kids, and a lot of times at the end they would have a PSA on some sort of parenting tip that would really come in handy for these women who uh, didn't know anything about parenting at the time. There were a lot of times when they had to get a, a temp temporary hotel room for a girl who was fleeing from abuse, or many times it was just some of the most mundane of exercises, just giving a ride to and fro from this place to that, and in the middle of that, someone entering into their vulnerable state mentoring them and showing them how to get through it together, that they were not alone. You think about another set of people, many times adoption happens not even from the high school age, but actually it's women who are in college. And they get into the situation where they don't know how to reach their career and educational goals. They don't know how to manage financially a child in college, and they usually have no support network and don't see how they could recover from having a child at that pivotal moment in life. And yeah, there are great stories of places that help with childcare. These single women graduate with PhDs after getting pregnant in college. But no matter what it is, no matter what group we're talking about, you know what was the determinative factor in that? Someone was with them, and someone told them, you can do this. You're not alone. We can get through this together. And just hearing that made all the difference for many of these girls. Here's my point. Why am I telling you this? Oftentimes, the vulnerable, the people that the Bible are talking about, the people that God cares for, the vulnerable are driven to adoption many times for the same reason they're driven to abortion. Because we're socially isolated, we're financially vulnerable, and they feel like that's their only option, their only way out, their only way to keep their head above water. And I'm saying, what if it wasn't? What if we could do something so that they didn't feel like that was their only option? What if they had people who followed Christ who entered into their difficulty with them? And so I'm saying, look into that. The first place you can start is your own family. This happens. Look into your own family. Are we there to help them? Another way is different non-for-profits like Parent Life. That's something that's always available. There are very cha various chapters of that, whether in Indianapolis area, even in Brownsburg, which is the one that Amber helped out with. Um, you have foster care. I mean, Lord knows there's a lot of help that begin, can be done by being a Christian family and entering yourself into the foster care community. There's an alternative foster care called safe-families.org. And uh, it's a Christian alternative that's actually meant to keep children out of some of the difficulties of foster care. And the reunification rate is actually 99% where these kids eventually can be reunified with their families and kept safe and families intact. And this last one, whew. many of you guys have heard the news about our brother David Rodriguez. So we support missionaries across the world, Bob Buchanan, Henry Gutu, Theophilus Barcatouche, and David Rodriguez in Argentina, his wife Rosa and their children. And we heard recently he passed away this week due to complications to COVID. Fatherless and widow. That's exactly what we're talking about. They're left vulnerable. We can help in that, can't we? And if you want to, 
We can contact Bob Buchanan, who stays in close contact with that family. We can contact the elders and figure out how we can help in this situation. The call of God is to enter into the vulnerability and to uplift. That's the point. Let's bow our heads as we go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, give us a heart, O oh God, to walk righteously, to be like those uh, saints of old who were spoken of, who had walked with you, who were righteous in all of their days. Father, help us to be like Job, to do what is right, and to help those who are vulnerable. Help us to be mindful of the poor. Help us to be mindful of the refugee. Help us to be mindful of the fatherless and the widow. There's so many ways that you, Father, in your grace and mercy have opened up to us that we can help. Help us, Father, to have the bravery to insert ourselves and to relieve needs. For you have called us to this, that we might be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Father, we love you. We pray for uh, David, his family, for Rosa. We pray that um, goodness and mercy would follow them and that many of those in the kingdom would uplift them, Father, in their prayers and with their needs. Blessings upon them, we pray this in Jesus' holy name, and amen. If you're not a Christian um, and you want to align yourself with Jesus Christ, you can do that uh, by proclaiming your allegiance to him and being baptized in the water for the forgiveness of your sins. If you have any need whatsoever, why don't you come right now while we stand and sing a song for your encouragement.